Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. So, I'm Toshiya Sonami from the Radiation Science Center Applied Research Laboratory in High Energy Accelerator Research Organization, KEK. That's in Japan. I'm sorry. And uh, it's showing me here that uh, we also operate uh, some of these uh, graduate school for the graduate student. And then it's, uh, my talk is the D double differential cross-section measurement for charged particle production reaction by gridded ionization chamber. As you may know that uh, most of the topic is already covered by two lecturers yesterday and the day before yesterday. So I'm sorry, there's a several overlap I have. So the double differential cross-section measurement for the charged particle production reaction by gridded ionization chamber. I will talk about uh, this topic uh, as an uh, example of this, the measurement of double differential cross-section of heading production, that's alpha production for the several MeV neutron induced reaction. That's uh, one of the topic for the measurement of N alpha reaction cross-section. And then it's, uh, this is a brief summary of why do we need to measure the N alpha DDX. That's already mentioned by lecturer. So the, Mostly the data uh, for high energy, I mean it's uh, not high energy, it's a fast neutron. That's a 40 MeV. <coughs> That's because uh, we want to plan to build the, it's a DT fusion reactor design. And we need data for the, as well as the operation. That's because that we have to estimate the damage on material due to the accumulation of gas. Actually, the alpha is a helium, so that we have several serious damage if the accumulation of the gas. And also that uh, we have to estimate the nuclear heating. That's because uh, we, uh, we developed a fusion reactor and the fusion process, the most of the energy going out with neutrons. So we have to estimate the how much neutron deposit the energy where and when. That's the, we need, that's the reason we need basic data of double differential cross-section. That double differential cross-section is not only the amount of reaction, also the energy and also the angle distribution, so we can do the full simulation. That's, in our art, uh, that one, the design is the neutronics. So the neutron transport and the energy deposition or the reaction, that's the total design we need. So the design, uh, the di double differential cross-section of N alpha is uh, very important. So to measure the double differential cross-section, what item do we need? <coughs> of course, we have to produce neutron for suitable energy. Uh, typically, the 4 MeV to 14 MeV, for example. That's because the 14 MeV is the upper limit of fusion, DT reaction. And then it's a 4 MeV is uh, close to the threshold if we assume the structure material in alpha cross reaction. That's because the alpha reaction, uh, the alpha particle, when uh, try to go in out, so the alpha particle feeds some of this coulomb barrier. So the, there is some threshold. So the neutron production, we have to know the neutron production reaction. We ha already have a very nice lecture on hands-on training yesterday. And then that's, uh, maybe <coughs> you guys know the detail of the uh, neutron production reaction. So slightly it repeat that part. And also that we have to measure the neutron. That's because we have to normalize the cross-section. That is also issue to determine the absolute value of double differential cross-section. To design the experiment, we have to estimate yield. Can we measure the particle? How much particle we're going to have or we, we are using the, our detector. So the yield estimation, I talk about that. And then that, uh, to design the yield, determine the yield estimation, that's uh, these two important parameters. One is the target thickness. The other is the detector solid term. Then we prepare the detector. So the, uh, firstly, I talk about the grid ionization chamber. And then it's, uh, outline the electronics and analysis, I will talk about that. So first, the neutron production. So the neutron production reaction measurement. So now facility, 
as a very common uh, we use the sorry three or four megavolt it's a electrostatic accelerator oh, no. Just. so this is a plan view of the our facility Actually, it's not our facility. That's not high energy. That's a low energy facility. And then when I was a university student, I play around the facility. Uh, you can see that here is actually the tank. And that's a 4.5. It's dynamitron, actually. And then it's a, this is analyzing magnet. And we have the 0 degree and 50 degree and 30, 45, and 60 degree port. So in past, the facility is mainly for the neutron interaction, neutron cross-section measurement. So you can see uh, it's a, too small, I'm sorry. That's a, two, two ports are dedicated for the neutron science. The one is the 15 degree and the other is the 30 degree. And 15 degree, uh, we have the goniometer, and then uh, that one is mainly for the neutron scattering experiment. So we also measure uh, scattering cross-section, so NN and NN dash or something like that. So that case, it's, uh, you have, this is the vacuum tube, and we put a small target in here, and also the sample in here, and the detector is uh, heavily sealed uh, inside the goniometer. And the other part, port for the neutron is a 30 degree. That is, uh, you can see, it's a relatively large space that's for the multi purpose. So we put several equipment and then play around to hold the neutron measurement. And also, the uh, grid ionization chamber also operates in this port. The other two, 45 and 60, that's for material radiation. So that's neutron science. So the helium accelerated and then injected on the material, then the people uh, take a look at the sample damage while they check the, its. Uh, stability or I don't know, it's, uh, some of the thing, uh, the material realization. And this one is for material analysis, so the RBS port. But this one, this it's, uh, configuration is already gone. Nowadays, the neutron interaction is not so important at this moment, so the operation is completely changed. So this port is disappear and then replaced to the peak C. PIXC means a PIXE, the proton induced X ray emission. That is also analysis technique. So the, that one is uh, the port is for PIXC, and this one is PIXC, so only one port for the multi purpose neutron experiment, but still ongoing. So to generate the neutrons, the following is, is a typical is a reaction. So already explained uh, by lecturers. So the, for the purpose of the structure material, the n alpha cross section measurements. So normally we use the TDN or DDN to cover the four to six. Actually, that's uh, if the, our accelerator operates uh, same as the specs. So maybe it's uh, reached to seven or eight, but uh, our accelerator is very old, so reach to the six or something like that, and. Uh, TDN, uh, normally we use the 40.1. That's because it's uh, in zero degree. You can calculate by using the yesterday's computer program. So you can set the 90 degree that you may have the much sharp the neutron energy of 14.1 MeV at the 90 degree or 100 degree or something like that. The target is the titanium tritium foil uh, and uh, in D. DD reaction, uh, we use the D2 gas target. So what is the important thing is uh, this intensity. This is, of course, this depends on the target or condition. If we use the much thicker target, so maybe you have so much neutron, but the uh, energy virus is very broad. So that uh, you can adjust the, what do you want to measure, well, what do you wanna, how much resolution you need. So then the uh, target sickness control is very important. So uh, anyway, so the order, the target, the order of magnitude is a 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 at 10 centimeter from the target. 
So you can estimate the, your yield based on these numbers. And this is unit, uh, so that uh, neutron per square centimeter per microcoulomb, so that it's, uh, if you have the one microampere, that's uh, the typical beam current of the accelerator, so you may have these numbers, neutrons. And a little bit detail about the target structure. That's because the yesterday poster that I saw the many is a target structure. And our target system is a very small and thin. That's because we don't want to scatter component around the target. So here is the, this one is a gas target. So the mainly for the D2 gas and DD reaction. So the, our cell is uh, roughly this is three centimeter, and this is uh, foil to separate the gas gas part and the vacuum part. This is the molybdenum foil. That's maybe common. That's a five micrometer. I'm sorry, that's not millimeter. That's five micrometer. And uh, we used to use the Herber foil also. That's a 2.2. .2. It's micro. I'm sorry, that's a <coughs> micrometer foil. But the beam current problem we have that uh, we want to increase the neutron yield. So easiest way is to just increase the number of deuteron so that we increase the deuteron beam current. But it's a half a hole is not so strong. So uh, you know, according to our experience, maybe one or two microampere beam is a limit for the hole. But we need more, so that case, uh, we use the molybdenum hole, you know, five micrometer. That's accept for three or four microampere. That will be two times more. And then that's, uh, the, f the other structure is here. It's, uh, you can see the insulator, and then it's a small tip in here. That is the aperture. So we need to make sure that all the beam going to the target, that's using the, this aperture. So this aperture co connect to the current ammeter, and then check the, how much it's the current we can have during the operation. And here is the pipe to fill the D2 gas, and then this uh, gas filling system. That's a very simple, just uh, make a vacuum by using the pump, and then fill the gas, and then measure the pressure. For titanium target, this is the titanium metal foil in here. Actually, this one needs the double tube to support the titanium foil. That's uh, because one of the tube is a blank, structure, and then put the titanium hole here, and then there's uh, another tube push and hold the titanium hole. That one is also the limit of beam current. You are not providing any cooling to this target? Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped that one. It's here. It's uh, cooling by air. Yeah. It's an air jet. That's because uh, we don't want to throw down the neutron by water. So I, we use only air jet. The same thing for the titanium target. But if we accelerate, uh, inject the deuterium beam too much, the case, the titanium evaporated and then go to the accelerator side. That w so that one is also the, some of the limit up to four microampere. It's our experience, actually. OK. So this is a typical spectrum of the 15 MeV case and the 5 MeV case. And uh, of course, that's a reduce. It depends on the target condition. If we put the so much deuterium gas inside the target, so maybe the reduce is broadened. And this one is a one atom case, a typical case. And you can see the sum of the structure in here. That's because uh, this one is a DT. So the deuteron hitting the tritium and then produce the, at the zero degree, the 15 MeV neutrons. But the, we also have the DD reaction. That's because the deuteron inject to the target hole and then accumulate it. So the titanium also has the deuteron. That's because of all the target, right? So in that case, uh, we also have the DD component. That's, uh, so every time we have to measure the neutron spectrum by time of flight technique to ensure the energy and also the low energy component. How to measure 
that's neutron spectrum we normally use the NE213, that's a very old, actually. Now it's a BC501A or let's say EJ301. Or anyway, that's a recipe is the same. So the rigid sincere term, two inch diameter and two inch length is a typically we use. That's because the scintillator provides the neutron gamma separation. That's really very important. <laughs> and then it's, uh, we put the scintillator the six meter or five meter away from the target and then that's a uh, Accelerator operate by pulse mode, and then we do the time of flight to check the neutron spectrum. Right? So here is another idea for to obtain the neutron, but it's a different energy. The one is the nitrogen 15 and neutron, and nitrogen 14 the neutron. That provides the neutron neutrons of 11.5 or 70. 7.7 MeV. That's because our accelerator is not so high terminal voltage. So in that case, uh, we cannot obtain the neutron between 66 and 14. So we can change the reaction. So of course, that one is not monoenergetic. That's because it's a residual nuclei, for example, so 15 nitrogen DN. So we're going to have the 16 ox oxygen. So this is the level scheme of 16 oxygen, so we can see the sum of the excited level. But important point is a discrepancy between two levels. There's a large energy difference. It's a 6 MeV. So this is the time of flight spectrum for the 15 nitrogen DN reaction. So you can see the 11.5 MeV neutron, and then we have some space, and then it's a low, much lower energy neutron. So for application of the NRF reaction cross-section, as I told you, the reaction cross-section has some of the threshold. If the threshold is higher than this energy, so the neutron is no impact. So that source could be monoenergetic for that reaction measurement. But uh, some of the case, uh, we have the small amount of reaction cross-section here. It's a 4 MeV or 5 MeV, so we have to correct the effect by using the DD source. The DD source can provide the 5 MeV neutron. But anyway, so this is uh, one of the idea to have the missing region, the 6 to 14 MeV. So 7.7 .7 and also the uh, sum of the structure. So let me talk about the easy estimation. So the talk about the target thickness and solid angle. So as the lecturer says yesterday, so if we need the information, only the total production, so the activation method is one of the effective methods to measure an alpha reaction. But of course, the residual should be radioactive. And most of the case of structured materials, so residual is not radi radioactive. So that case, we can apply this one. This. And the other method is a helium accumulation, which is the structure material sample packed the heavily, and then it's uh, irradiated by neutrons for a long time, I don't know, the weeks or something like that. Then it's uh, accumulated helium measured some way. That's a helium accumulation method. These two can provide only total production. But we need the double differential cross section, so that case. And normally, we use the counter telescope method to measure the double differential. That's because the counter telescope easily defines the angle and energy. So, here is the schematic drawing of the experimental setups. So, we have some beam accelerate from accelerator, and then we can have the neutron production target. So, the neutron production target provides neutrons, and then we put target in some way from the, away from the uh, target, neutron production target, and then the neutron uh, induced alpha particle measured by some of the detector. So what, when we want to know the double differential cross-section, we can set the detector position uh, around it, uh, uh, the angles, and then it's, uh, so, we can measure the double differential cross-section by using this uh, small detector. 
but the, this experiment is a neutron experiment, so we have to care the background. So always the neutron experiment, we have to care the background. So the one is the proton also produced and then emitted and then enter the detector, and also the neutron is not collimated, and then that uh, directly hit the detector or gamma also uh, produced and uh, affected to the detector. Uh, normally, we use the detector for counter telescope case, so we use detector as a semiconductor detector or this combination of the combined with scintillator. And uh, we have to think about the solid angle, that's because the detector size is too small and it's a bit far away. So how much particle can we measure by using this solid angle? That's a very important factor. So the first, uh, we have to think about the target, that the target means the sample to be measured for in our reaction. So what we have to think about is one is the production rate. Of course, we have to measure the production rate, so we don't know. But we have some data to estimate the production rate. So first, we have to know the production rate. And then it's a energy res resolution, what we need. That's because if we use the very thick target, so the alpha particle emitted, and then energy loss inside the target, and then distort their own energy. So in that case, uh, we need to think about energy reduction, what we need, and also the background, we have to take care and try to minimize the background. Once we use the thin target, of course, the count rate should be low, but energy resolution is high. That's because of the energy loss within the target is minimized. That's because of the thin target. And also, the, we need some backing foil, so we have to think about the effect of backing foil. That's because the thin target normally we use, uh, we prepare the, some of this uh, backing foil and then put on uh, by the backing evaporation or some of the technique and the very thin layer we build and then we're going to use. So the, we have to take care of what backing foil we use. And in contrast, the thick target, that thick target is uh, relatively thick. That's not totally stock. But anyway, so it's a uh, thick target case, so that's a high count rate we're going to have. But uh, of course, it's a degreed, degreed energy resolution. And, but it's a thick target that so self-support sample is available. That's, uh, you can choose uh, what we need. Uh, the energy resolution, the production rate, and background, we need to balance the parameter. <coughs> right? So, E is the estimation. That's a very simple equation. That's the yield, uh, the multiply, that's a number of atoms and cross section and flux. So, let me think about the cross section, the one band, for example. And neutron flux, we assume the DD neutron. So that uh, at 10 centimeters from the target, we have the order of 10 to the 4 neutron per square centimeter per second, for example. And the uh, target thickness, in this case, let's assume the 1 micrometer. So that you can calculate how much atom we have. This is also a typical number, the 10 to the 18 or 19. Or that's a typical sample number of atom. So you can multiply these three factors, and then you have the yield. So that case, the 0.2 alpha particle per square cent per second. This number is not so large, you see. That's one second, 0.2, but four pi. So if you measure the alpha particle, entire alpha particle, but even in that case, it's 0.2 alpha particle per second, which means the 720 event per hour. So that is, this is the typical condition of N alpha measurement. So the, anyway, the problem is statistics. So the solid angle, we have to take, take into account the solid angle. That's because now it's a four pi emission rate. It's 720 per one hour experiment. But you see, uh, for example, so that's a silicon detector, the typical area is 500 square millimeter. That's a commercially available, it's a either Ortec or Canberra, or they provide the commercially available silicon semiconductor detector with the area of 500 uh, square meter. This is the one inch diameter, corresponding to one inch diameter. Of course, there's a solid angle, uh, <coughs> angle 
resolution, the trade off, if you want to maximize the solid angle, so very close position, you have to put the detector, and then that's the most of the particle you can measure, but may, you may lose the angular resolution totally. So let's think about that's a 10 centimeter away from the target, and assume the 500 square meter, so the solid angle is roughly the 0 0.05 strategian, for example. This is a typical setup, and then let's uh, angular radius is plus minus 7.2 degree. That's uh, not so small, right? Your 30 degree data have radius plus minus 7, right? At that case, uh, the, we have the counting rate, uh, the 36 count per an hour. That could be acceptable, maybe. <laughs> it's uh, not, so, not so large, but uh, it could be accept acceptable. So how much, and then let's, uh, let's think about the energy loss in target. So you, you know, you may know that's uh, very famous, the beta equation. And our target is alpha particle measurement, so the up to 10 MeV, so beta is very small, so we can neglect this part. And then let's, uh, the energy loss is proportional to G square and the inverse proportion of V square. But actually, uh, we don't need to calculate this uh, uh, equation. Uh, simply take the data from data table where you can use the stream code. That's a famous code. You can download and use this one. The code says the alpha particle range in nickel, for example, so 4.5 MeV alpha particle the range is 8.04 micrometer in nickel. So the 8.4 micrometer nickel is enough to stop the 4.5 in other words. Well, 5 my MeV, that's a 9.2 something, right? So which means if we enter the 5 MeV alpha particle in the nickel foil and the, the thickness is 1 micrometer, so let's say, take a look, the difference is 8 and 9. So we, we can have the 0 0.5 energy loss within the fire, right? It depends on what you need, actually. So that's uh, if you want to measure 5 MeV alpha particle with the 0 0.5, it's a 10% resolution, so the one micrometer sample thickness will be acceptable. But if not, so we have to reduce the some target for thickness. It depends on what you need. So later I, I can show the, some of the example for the three micrometer result and the 0 0.3 micrometer result. That's a significant <coughs> difference between two. And how much cross section we're gonna have? It's, this is the condition that uh, horizontal axis correspond to the neutron energy. That's uh, 20 MeV, 10 MeV, 5 MeV. So the cross section start and three or something like that. And this is the cross section uh, in burn. So the, you can see this, uh, most of the, this is evaluated data, ENDF, GF, and China data, and Japanese data. And there is uh, some difference, but anyways, that's a uh, cross section reached to 0 0.1, which means the 100 milliband. So the previous estimation, I assume the one band so it should be 10 times smaller. <laughs> so we need to improve the yield estimation. So the cross section goes to the 0 0.1, but the neutron flux we can increase, that's because we can use the three microampere beam, for example, so the three times more. But target thickness the two six, I think, that's because of this 0 0.5 MeV, 10%, is not acceptable. That's because typical grid ionization chamber provides energy resolution of less than 2% or something like that. We lose the sum of the information because of the target thickness. We don't want, so let's say 0 0.25 or something like that. So yield now the, for 4 pi uh, per second is a 0 0.015. And then that, uh, we assume the telescope, uh, so the 0 0.05 straight angle, so the, as a result, the yield should be 0 0.2 counts per hour. That's not acceptable, absolutely. 
that because of this, uh, most of the event is a background and nothing about the new alpha particle. So this fact is main motivation to use the grid ionization chamber, I think. That's because the grid ionization chamber provides four pi slit angle. So the count rate uh, increase uh, multiplied by four pi, four pi, so it means that uh, 54 count per hour count rate. That will be acceptable, I think. That's. So the everyone, most of the person uh, to measure the alpha particle by using grid ionization chamber, that's because of the solid angle, right? And uh, in addition to that, uh, the, we measure the alpha particle uh, with the whole pi solid angle, but we can distinguish their energy and angle at the same time. That is also an advantage of grid, uh, gridded ionization chamber. The other solution is just prepare the intense neutron salt. That's also good, right? And that also works. So, for example, so the RANS, the Los Alamos group, by using the counter telescope, uh, but they prepare a much intense neutron beam and combine with the time of flight, and then they provide very nice experimental data. So, let's start about the detector section. So we have uh, already done the yield and also neutron production, and then we need to prepare the detector. So first, this is the typical uh, the counter telescope setup uh, prepared by Los Alamos group. So they produce the intense neutron flux by using the RANS, it's a WNR source, and then it's a source is somewhere here, actually. It's a, you can see it's a 9.12 meter from the source. The, here is a sample. So that's because the, their source is not monoenergetic. So the time of flight they need to analyze the what neutron induce the reaction. So here is a window, and this is the vacuum chamber, and here is a sample. It's a target, they say. And uh, you can see that's a five centimeter square, it's a collimator. And then it's a 8.9 uh, diameter target, but it uh, has a have an angle. And then here is the detector system. They have one, two, three, four detector system. And then each detector has the low pressure, the proportional counter, and then silicon surface barrier detector. And in addition to that, it's uh, not described, but uh, they have the CSI, that's a CSI scintillator. It's a three-stage uh, telescope. And uh, the whole neutron production, they use the 800 MeV proton on tungsten target, so that's not monoenergetic. And uh, their course is 90 degree, and uh, they the course provide uh, 1 to 5, 50 MeV neutron with time of flight. So this is the typical output of detect the detector system. For example, so here, the horizontal axis correspond to the energy, and the vertical axis correspond to the, uh, the energy loss. So you can see that uh, once we fix the energy, but we may have the several energy loss event that's because the different particles provide different energy loss. So this is the typical particle identification of delta E and E method. So they only choose this alpha event and then make a spectrum and then make, develop the cross section. All right, so let's move to the grid ionization chamber. So what is grid ionization chamber? You may already know, I'm sorry, that's an overlap section actually. So the grid ionization chamber is the parallel plate and the power small ionization chamber with grid. So ionization chamber, you may know that the output signal depends on the position of interaction. Later I will detail, explain detail. And then that's a grid ionization chamber just at the grid, but we can remove the dependency <coughs> by introducing the grid. And then that's, uh, to apply the grid ionization chamber for double differential cross-section measurement, so we're going to install the sample, the target, on the cathode. 
And then it's a combined anode and cathode signal to deduce the energy and angle. That's already mentioned by the lectures. So this is the schematic diagram of ionization chamber. So you may have, you can see this. Here is an anode and the cathode. That's a parallel plate. And we have the voltage. So we can have the electric field here. For simplicity, uh, that's, uh, just ion comes from this direction and parallel to the plate. That's not real, actually. There's uh, many directions we can have, but uh, we assume the parallel ion beam. So we have the capacitance, and also this, uh, we have the voltage and the number of ion pairs here. That's because of this uh, ionization. And then that's uh, electric field in here. And uh, here is the velocity and time uh, for the electron and ion. So we would like to understand the how, what kind of the output uh, from this setup. So the easiest way is to uh, think about the energy con conservation law. So the initial energy of this it's a parallel plate. Uh, we have the C and the, so the applied voltage, and then. Uh, after the it's a movement of electron and ion, so reduce the stored energy, the remaining stored energy, stored energy here, and then it's uh, the energy uh, used for the electron electron drift, electron movement, and also the ion movement. These are uh, it's a proportional to this uh, the distance travel, traveling distance. So uh, finally we have. Uh, this uh, equation. That's a VR is output. So this is the uh, voltage uh, transition, the schematic view of the voltage transition. The here is the time, and here is the voltage. So first, uh, the electron start the moving. That's because the electron drift velocity, that's a famous, that's a microsecond per centimeter. So the one, one microsecond we need to travel one. Oh, that's a, maybe opposite. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the velocity. And uh, the point is the ion velocity is a thousand times more. So thousand times more is uh, during the electron traveling, the ion almost stop and not contribute to the signal. So the first, uh, we have the electron contribution. And then it's a thousand times later, we have the ion contribution. But the a millisecond traveling time is not acceptable for us. That's because the detector limited of the millisecond time response. That the counting rate is uh, determined by the traveling time. So the millisecond traveling time means the kilo, kilo uh, CPS. That's the counting rate is 1,000 per second. That's because the inverse of the millisecond. So that's, uh, normally we operate the chamber uh, with the, this mode. That's uh, we call the electron sensitive mode. So that we can change the time constant of the readout of the electron system and then pick up the electron contribution only. So that case, you can see that uh, voltage uh, caused by electron, uh, we have the X here. X means the incident position of ion. So it depends on the incident, uh, the power side depends on the incident position of ion. That's because the traveling distance could be changed. So <coughs> if we introduce the grid just before the anode, so the situation needs to change. Of course, we can, in, the grid uh, should be, it's a, we, Actually, there's uh, several requirements we need. So the add grid in front of the anode plate, and then what happened is, uh, but before do that, so yes, that the grid is said to be uh, one is the transparent to electron. We can choose the parameter, which is the grid diameter, and also spacing, and also this electric field, and then make transparent to electron. And also the grid should shield the electric field between the cathode grid 
to anode and grid, so the grid should separate the ionization chamber to two space, the different ionization chamber, but same electron we, we use. So that case, the electron drift to the grid, and then the grid is transparent to electrons, so the all the electrons pass through the grid and the tower to the anode. So let's think about the, between the grid and the anode. So the electron always travel from the grid to anode. Either x is 0 or it's x equal d. That's because it's an electron this traveling distance. Still, we have the difference between the cathode and the grid, but all the electron goes to the anode and the pass passing through the grid, and then it's, uh, this distance is fixed for all the situation. That is the point of why we introduced the grid. So what happened that is the, let's think about this part, and then the ion injected in the grid ionization chamber, and then ionization, but we don't have any signal at this part, that's because it's, uh, Electron starts from here, the tower to the grid. That's a no influence of this part. That's because the electric shield. Then the electron passing through the grid, so the start signal, and then always travel the same distance, DAZ. Right? So the, we can measure the number of electron without considering the X value. That is the point. Right? So, we apply the method to the it's a neutron cross-section measurement. So that case, the neutron comes to, from this direction, and then the red line, that's a target. And then it's a, here is a cathode, and this is the anode. So just before the anode, we put green. So the, as I told you, that's a, if the particle, that's the alpha particle, stopped between the cathode and grid. So the produced electron always go passing through the grid and then reach to anode and then travel same distance, DAG. So that uh, parasite anode, that anode output is nearly equal to their energy. But for cathode, they have the, some dependency. That's because of the, uh, the cathode is a traveling distance as a, as a function of the it's a emitted angle. If the same length, the same energy, so which means the same length of this uh, range, but its uh, angle is uh, small, so it should be, its uh, traveling distance is very short, but angle is very large, so the traveling distance uh, nearly equal to D, so the high output. So that's dependency, we can combine the D two signal and then estimate the energy and angle. So this is the actual uh, the instrument to measure the Newton DDX. So you can see here uh, the D2 gas target and this one is connected to the accelerator so the D2 beam comes in here and then produce a neutron. We put one collimator to collimate the neutron and then they irradiate this chamber. So here is a sample. So this one is a cathode. So here is an anode, but this one is a double-sided. That's because of the, we want to measure the not only forward angle, also the backward angle. Then here is a grid. And we have the, some of the structure to change the sample. Uh, it's a, gear structure, that's because of the, we don't want to open the grid ion chamber to measure the background. As I told you, that's a, we're going to use the thin sample. The thin sample needs some backing, so we need to subtract the backing effect. So we measure the, not only the sample itself, also the, the backing measurement, and then subtract. During the procedure, so we don't want to open the grid ion chamber, so we need some structure to change the sample remotely from outside. You can see it, the one more electron here, that's we call sealed. That's because the, we apply the high voltage or anode plate, 
and then this structure should be ground, so we have the additional electric field between the anode and body. So that makes uh, signal so that we need to avoid the effect, so we applied one of the electrodes, which is called the field, and then it's, uh, it has the same potential or anode, so we don't, actually we don't have any electric field between the shield and anode, and reduce, uh, the avoid the effect of uh, this electric field. And this one is a little bit sick, that's because of that we need to apply the counting gas with the positive pressure. That's because the distance between the cathode to grid is rather short, is 2.5 centimeter. 2.5 centimeter, uh, the normal gas pressure is not enough to stop the alpha particle, what we want to measure. So we put the pressurized gas up to 10 atom and then stop the proton. So here is the vacuum line. That's because that's how we have to use the pressurized gas. So we have to shield, shield the vessel. So before seal the vessel, we need to pump out and make a vacuum and to avoid the contamination, and then the close the valve and introduce the gas from outside. That is a structure. So this is the sample changer mechanism. Here is a gear, and we can set the three sample at the same time. So the one is the, for example, nickel 58, the other is natural nickel, and one is the backing itself, and then repeat change and do the experiment, uh, measurement. But sometimes we forgot the position. So at this time, for the, that situation, we put the small amount of magnesium here and check the position to rotating where we are. And also, the, this ammonium is uh, alpha emitter 5.48, 5.5 and maybe alpha uh, is used for calibration. So this is the cross section. So the, this is the this part is corresponded here, and we have uh, some of this uh, difficult structure. That uh, is a bit problem. That's because that's, uh, we cannot measure the nine, exact 19 degree alpha particle. That's because of the this structure. But anyway, uh, this is the sample changer. So our detector parameter, uh, distance between the electrodes, electrode means a cathode and grid, so effectivity distance to stop the alpha particle is 25 millimeter, and diameter of electrode, electrode is 75 millimeter, and distance between grid and anode is 5 millimeter. We can calculate the shielding inefficiency that's uh, described by using this uh, equation as a function of the wire spacing and the wire radius and distance between anode and grid. So typically, we can fill the gas uh, with the 10 atom. That is, the reason is uh, simply that's a Japanese regulation. We need to, ex we need to have some of the inspection if we want to exceed the 10 atoms. So that 10 atom is the limit. That's because of the regulation. And then it's, uh, later, I can show you that uh, drift velocity. And then it's, uh, we apply the high voltage of 6 kilovolt or 9 kilovolt, uh, the anode. And then we have the, some of the drift velocity. And then that's a pulse shape, shaping determined. So here is the filling, talking about the filling gas. So filling gas, as you may know, uh, we use the noble gas, typically, with a few percent of molecular gas that drastically improve the electron drift velocity. So normally we use argon, krypton, even it's xenon. You can see there's uh, many curves. Uh, I'm sorry, this one is too small to take a look. But normally we use up add uh, it's a CH4, that's a methane, or CO2, that's a CO2. Well, in this case, also CH4 and CO2. So what is interesting is uh, here. The horizontal axis corresponds to the electric field strength. 
and vertical axis corresponding the velocity of electron. So once we increase the electric field, so of course the direct velocity is also increased. But some of the point, the velocity is saturated. So the point, what do we want to use? That's because uh, we don't need to apply much more uh, electric field. That's because uh, the high voltage limitation and also the uh, chance to discharge or there's uh, many problems we're going to have. So that we can use this uh, saturated point. So that one is, for example, so here is a 0 0.2, right, few percent of the methane or a few percent of CO2. The case uh, is a 0 0.2 or 0 0.3. That's a typical number of the required electric field. So if we use the one atom gas and also the, the distance is 5 centimeter, uh, actual case, uh, our case is the 2.5, but let's assume the 5 centimeter. So that's a one atom and a 5 centimeter multiply. So we need one kilovolt high voltage. And then this one provides that's three centimeter per microsecond, the drift, electron drift velocity. That's a typical number. So that's a few centimeter, it's an ionization chamber, you apply the kilovolt, and then that's a correction time is microsecond. Okay, so the gas pressure, how to determine the gas pressure, that's because, that's not so difficult. That's just adjust the thickness uh, which, which you need. Sickness means uh, the, uh, the function of the alpha particle energy. So let's assume, for example, the energy of alpha particle is 10 MeV. So we choose the Krypton gas, that's because of background, and then that's uh, how much length we need is uh, 69.85 millimeter. That's uh, more than 25 millimeter, which is the spacing of our chamber. So what should we do is just increase the gas pressure to fit the range. So 2.8 atom, for example, we need. So the important thing is this. So the, the nickel irradiated by neutron and then produced alpha, but also the proton also. And the proton, under this condition, the proton can stop. 2.5 MeV proton could be stopped under this pressure. So naturally, we can discriminate the high energy proton event. That's because of detector thickness. So we can measure the 10 MeV, up to 10 MeV alpha particle, but we cannot measure the more than 2.5 MeV. So that's how we can reduce the <coughs> effect uh, from proton by using the gas condition. But of course, uh, we can apply and, uh, much more high pressure so that case, let's say 10 atom, so we can measure, of course, let's say 10 maybe alpha particle or more, but the proton energy also increased, uh, that's 5.5, for example. So under this condition, that's a 2.8 atom, so we have the clean area from the 2.5 to 10 maybe for alpha particle, but that area region is reduced. Uh, so it's an important thing is the minimum gas pressure should be chosen for measurement. Okay, so here is the gas filling system. As I told you before, that's, uh, here is the grid ionization chamber. So before filling the gas, we make the vacuum uh, to remove the impurities uh, of gas or gas or air inside the grid ionization chamber. It takes uh, dates actually, and then let's close the valve and fill the gas from the gas bottle. And one of the important thing is the contamination of gas. So we use the oxygen trap to remove the oxygen. That is the electronegative gas. So that uh, easily attach the electron and then it uh, reduce the pulse height signal. And here is the electronics that's uh, really is, uh, old, actually. It's uh, not so special. The normally uh, connected to the preamplifier, and then it's uh, 
it's a spectroscopy amplifier and the ADC for pulse height analyze. These uh, it's, uh, three parameters, that's an uh, anode and uh, it's a uh, cathode. And then it's a, uh, because of a neutron uh, experiment, we have so many, it's a uh, background of, and also the noise. So uh, to reduce the noise count, uh, so we need uh, some of the coincidence between the cathode and anode, and then they, it's a uh, gate, the signal. That's uh, not special. So before taking the data, uh, we need to check the detector condition by taking the saturation. That's because the, we need to make sure all electrons should be corrected. So we need to check the pulse height of uh, instilled americium alpha particle and then changing the electric field and then uh, check the saturation and determine the applied voltage. It slightly depends on the it's a gas pressure, so every time we need to check the kind of saturation. And also, that's, uh, we have to correct, uh, think about uh, geometrical inexchange. That's because as a trade-off, we installed the sample changer mechanism, but that mechanism provides some of the difficulty. That's because it's an angled flag, and it's an alpha particle you can measure that because of this structure. So we do the Monte Carlo calculation, and then it's, uh, here is the horizontal axis corresponding to the emission angle, and this is the probability. So that the uh, angle of particle you cannot measure uh, that because of this structure. And this is the experimental data. Later, I will explain how to take a look at this one. But actually, that's, uh, this one is confirmed by experimentally by using the six lithium and thermal T alpha reaction. For counting gas. So there are several choices for counting gas. The one is argon or krypton and even for xenon, uh, several. Here is the one of the examples. Uh, so the, this is the horizontal axis corresponding to the pulse height and then vertical uh, corresponding number of counts. So the pulse height uh, is equal to the it's, uh, energy. So once we use the argon plus 5% of CO2 gas uh, as a counting gas, so the dot corresponds to the sample with sample. That's a sample at this moment is a nickel sample. So the nickel alpha we can observe, but uh, there is a significant the background that because of argon and alpha reaction, and also the oxygen and alpha reaction. So that situation is not preferable, so we change the gas to the krypton. So the krypton case, the reaction channel is closed. Uh, that's because of the Q value, and also that's uh, only that we have the oxygen and alpha reaction peak in here. If you don't want, the oxygen in alpha peak, in some of the case, some of the case means the, we have to measure the low energy alpha particle. That case, uh, we don't want huge oxygen peak. So we can use the CH4 to remove the oxygen. And then we don't have any peak component here. But we have huge component of recoil proton in here. It's a trade-off. We also take care of, about the background from the chamber itself and the electrode. As I <coughs> show you, the structure of the chamber is totally sealed by electrode, and this electrode made from heavy metal, which has the high it's a Coulomb barrier to prevent the alpha particle emission. So that is a special for neutron cross-section measurement. So here is the two-dimensional plot of the anode output and cathode output. As I told you, that's an, it's anode output correspond to the energy. And uh, once we fix the anode output, the uh, distribution correspond to the uh, emission angle. So this one is the width target and without target. And here is the alpha area. So you can see almost nothing here. That's a very nice condition, for example. And then that's a. Uh, we use the 300 microgram Pascal centimeter as a 
nickel uh, for the measurements. So that one needs enough thin to resolve the several the components. You can see the, this straight line. So this uh, point is uh, correspond to zero degree, and this point is uh, 90 degree. So how to analyze the data by using the 2D sorting? So that one is correspond to the zero degree. It's a cosine is 1.0, and cosine is 0.8, and 0 0.6, and 0 0.4, and 0 0.2, and 0. And they make a slice, and then it's a series of 1D spectrum. We have to normalize this energy, this, this uh, energy spectrum by using the target thickness and the number of neutron. So the target thickness uh, provides uh, the number of target atom, and then this one is the rate I, I will explain. That's the number of proton, recoil proton, uh, convert to the neutron flux, and then normalize. So after normalization, we have the double differential cross section in laboratory system, so we change uh, combat the laboratory system to CM system, and then it's an uh, integration uh, as a energy according to the energy, and then it's an angular differential cross section. The angular differential cross section integrated uh, concerning the angular angular angles uh, by using the Lusian fitting, and then it's a production cross section. Finally, we have. So how to measure the neutron flux is very simple. So just put on the, this is a telescope, which is, the, here is the poly, poly film, and here is the surface barrier detector. That's a very simple structure. And we have make a vacuum in, inside. So once irradiate the system for neutron, so we have this kind of spectrum. So after that, we remove the polyethylene and then take the background. So we have some of the difference in here. It correspond to the proton event from the polyethylene. So you know, you know that's a HNP. That's a cross section. In the standard we have a data. So using the cross section, we estimate the neutron flux from this structure. So you can see there's a several peak structure. That's because of the interaction inside the silicon detector. So silicon detector also that, uh, have the N alpha cross section. And then this one is N alpha 0, N alpha 1, or something like that. But uh, in this energy, it's not significant, so we can subtract the effect by using the background measurement. But if you don't want to subtract system, so that, that case, we may put some of the transmission detector and the required coincidence, so totally disappear the event. Oops. So this is the example of the alpha particle double differential cross section. So horizontal axis corresponds to the energy MEB, and the vertical axis the cross section. The neutral energy is 5 MeV, and this is for 32 degree, and this is the background angle. The one 148 degree. So these two spectrum, you can see, and only the difference is the sample thickness. This one is the 0 0.3 milligram per square centimeter, and this one is correspond to the 3 millimeter. It's a 10 times thick case. So you can see the, in thin sample, the, some of the structure, that's because the residual nuclei of NLH reaction, we have uh, 55 iron, it's a grand state, and the fast excited state is a 400 keV difference. To observe such difference, we need to use thin sample. Uh, six sample, uh, three milligram per square centimeter, that's the energy loss in the sample uh, reached to the more than one MeV. So we cannot observe this structure by using six sample. Okay, here it's that one of the example of the double differential cross section for different energy. This is a 5.2 MeV, and this is a 6.22 MeV, and the angle is a 32 degree and 63 degree. So with increasing the energy, so we can <coughs> observe much higher 
that's a state component in here. Let's still keep the alpha 0 and 1, 2, 3. And the line is the just the theoretical calculation for the uh, statistical uh, decay model and uh, yeah, fairly agreement uh, some of the difference in here, the anyway. So by integrating the energy, so we can obtain the angular distribution, for example, uh, for each component, this alpha zero and alpha one and more than alpha two. So that's uh, some of the, the difference uh, according to the component. Here is the angle and this is the cross section. Uh, by integrating the, this point, and then we have the cross section for the alpha zero and the alpha one, the alpha two or more. And the line is again the theoretical calculation, and that's a, it's a really difficult to take a look. But this one is a triangle and uh, obtained by the, the Obnitz group, and it's a very good agreement between the. Uh, our data for alpha and alpha two or more, but alpha zero is the sum of the difference we observe. So this one is the final slide, I think, that's a total that's a excitance function of 58 nickel, and also that's a natural nickel, that's a X alpha reaction cross section. So we have uh, several data and still scattered out, but uh, maybe the difference is within the factor. So let me summarize the first talk. So the, I talk about the item should be prepared for the neutron induced alpha produced the double differential cross section measurement. So the first I'll talk about the neutron production, and then let's uh, talk about the ED estimation and the detector itself. That's all I have for today. So thank you.